probably from what you've heard, I mean, we, you get me going? Because I'm just going. So, go, um, go, go, go. Because, you know, growing up, once we became Christians, I didn't become a Christian until I was 27, you know? So people are like, oh yeah, I've been a Christian all my life. No, you ain't. You got to meet Jesus. Make it personal. Put him on the inside. Just because you grew up in church like I did and all this religious stuff. No, no, no. It's a relationship. Amen? Amen. So when I met him, um, we started to turn our Christmas around. Because, you know, we used to tell the Christmas story to Mary Catherine. You know, it was the night before Christmas one. So we decided we're going to read it out of Luke chapter 2. So every time I do this and I read it out of different translations, I kind of stumble and stammer a little bit because it's about memorized in my head. Because even after that, when Isaac came along, we still keep doing it. So we've probably been reading it out of the King James Version for like almost 20 years. So it kind of like, it, it's in there. So um, but I want to read it out of this translation this morning. And what I want to do is just kind of pause and go and just share some thoughts that we, as we go. And see what the Spirit of God wants to do. Amen? Amen. So again, open up your heart. Let Him speak to you. Again, through this story this morning that we all know so well. So in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, Around the time of Elizabeth's amazing pregnancy and John's birth, we know that was John the Baptist, the emperor of Rome, Caesar Augustus, required everyone in the Roman Empire to participate in a massive census. The first census since Quirinius became governor of Syria. Each person had to go to his own ancestral city to be counted. In other versions, say tax. Taxes have been going on a long time, ain't they? So we see this background. It says the political background is an incidental. It is critical to the story. Conquering nations in the ancient world worked in various ways. Some brutally destroyed and plundered the nations they conquered. Some conquered people as slaves or servants. Other empires, and this is kind of how the Roman Empire functioned, allowed the people to remain in their land and work as before, but with one major change. The conquering people had to pay taxes to their rulers. The purpose of the census, like the one in Luke, describes is to be sure that everyone was appropriately taxed and so they knew who was in charge. Taxation was a way of keeping everybody kind of reined in. Having to follow those elites, so to speak. So we know the story starting in verse 4. Mary, Joseph, uh, Mary's fiance Joseph from Nazareth and Galilee had to participate in the census in the same way everyone else did. Because he was a descendant of King David, his ancestral city was Bethlehem, David's birthplace. Mary, who was late in her pregnancy, that the messenger Gabriel, the messenger Gabriel or the angel Gabriel had predicted, accompanied Joseph. While in Bethlehem, she went into labor and gave birth to a firstborn son. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a feeding trough because the inn had no room for them. Okay, the inn wasn't, didn't have room, but guess what? That was Joseph's hometown, wasn't it? You think there might have been a little family around? Could have maybe shacked up somewhere, but guess what? They weren't married. And she was pregnant. And that wasn't cool. That was a big no-no. How much times have changed? But that's a big no-no that even the family says, no, we can't have you around here. Why? So in verse 8, it says, nearby in the fields outside Bethlehem, a group of shepherds were guarding their flocks from predators in the darkness of night. Now understand, when you were in the field at night, they didn't have those street lights. It was dark. Okay, they probably had a fire going to help keep the predators from coming. So all they had was a campfire. Have you ever sat around a campfire at night? It's still kind of dark, isn't it? It's just kind of lit right where you were. It says, suddenly a messenger or an angel of the Lord stood in front of them and the darkness was dispelled by the glorious light, the shining light of God's glory. And the first thing he says is, and the first thing it says they were, the shepherds were terrified. 
Now, can you imagine? Put yourself in their shoes. You're out. Just a normal night. Watching the sheep. The fire's going. You're telling some stories or whatever. And all of a sudden, this angel shows up. It would be pretty terrifying because he lit up the whole area. And they were terrified. They weren't expecting it. He just kind of showed up. And now he says to the shepherds, don't be afraid. First words out of their mouth. Don't be afraid. Either he saw they were afraid or he knew him just kind of showing up would freak him out. Mm -hmm. So he said, don't be afraid. Then the next word he says is, listen. You know what happens when you get afraid? You don't listen. Mm -hmm. Know what happens when you get upset? You don't listen. Because what happens when your emotions take over, your ears kind of turn off. And the angel knew that. He knew they'd be afraid. So he said, don't be afraid. Basically, get a grip. Now listen. He says, I bring good news. News of great joy. News that will affect all people everywhere. So this ain't just for you guys, it's for everybody. He says, today in the city of David, and this is why I picked this translation, I like this phrase, he says, a liberator. A liberator. What, is that what does a liberator do? A liberator. He sets you free. He sets you free. So he wants them to know right off the bat, the one that's being born is a liberator to set you free. See, a lot of people live in the world today don't think they're bound. They think they're free. No, you're not. You are subject to addictions, past behaviors, past thinking patterns. You are more of a, bond, a person in bondage than you realize. Because you go with the flow. Do what people tell you? You're not liberated. You're in bondage. So the good news is a liberator is showing up. One that will set you truly free. He goes on, it's been born to you. He is a promise, the promise anointed one. The Messiah. The supreme authority, he says. Which we know is Lord. It says you will... No, you have found him when you see a baby wrapped in a blanket laying in a feeding trough. At that moment, the first heavenly messenger was joined by thousands of other messengers, or angels, a vast choir. And the choir was saying this, the highest of heavens of the universe, glory to God, on earth, peace among all people who bring pleasure to God. See, where does peace come from? Bringing pleasure to God. God and Jesus? See, we think peace on earth, goodwill towards men, it's just, you're at peace. No, 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 there's the other side of the coin, right? Those that please God will be at peace. Because God resists the proud, right? right? Gives grace to the humble. Right. So we want to understand that concept. That was the literal message. There's a liberator, there's the Messiah, the anointed one, and there's the Lord coming. This is great news for everybody. And there'll be peace if you do what pleases Him. Now, verse 15, it says this. I'll probably read this and then just share some pieces, or I don't know, we'll see how it goes. As soon as the heavenly messengers disappeared into heavens, the shepherds were buzzing with conversation. The shepherds were buzzing with conversation. Can you imagine being there? And all of a sudden, here's this angel. I'm imagining he was probably pretty big. Lit up the whole area. Then all of a sudden, as you look into the sky, the whole sky lit up, and there were thousands of angels in the sky. And he gives this message. And then all of a sudden, boom, back to darkness. Man, the conversation get to buzzing. <laughs> and know what I think? We, we've missed this point today in the church. 
Spiritual encounters ought to bring a buzz of conversation. People don't want to share conversation anymore because if you share what really happened to you, a God experience, we'll put it that way, people will think you're weird. They will. There is no buzz anymore over God encounters in people's lives. Do you know people still see angels today? How many times have we had a conversation that buzzed around about angels? People have seen angels in the church. I got told one Sunday, preaching in the other building, somebody saw an angel following me as I was walking across the farm. And as soon as the angel realized the person could see him, it disappeared. None of you knew that, did you? Because we don't buzz over spiritual encounters. Why? Why are we sharing spiritual encounters that are going on? They did. They did because a spiritual encounter ought to stir you up. Because look what happens. It says, next, the shepherds are now talking. Let's rush down to Bethlehem right now. Let's go. It says, let's see what's happening. But notice the next phrase. If you're following the notes, I got it in red. And it's in red for this reason. It says, let's experience what the Lord has talked about. Let's experience what he's told us. Do you understand the word of God is to be experienced? To be taken in. Planted in the heart. So it may grow and bear fruit. People don't even experience the word of God anymore. Don't we want to do a fight and argue about it? Well, I'm not sure that's right. Let me check that out. You ought to check it out. You ought not just, just take it at face value. But once you check it out, it ought to bring a buzz. Because you want to experience it. Not in your head, but in your heart. Amen? Amen. So that your roots can grow down in the love of God and the tree flourish and bear fruit. That's what they said. Man, we got to go check this thing out. Not because they doubted it, they were excited. So they ran down to town, it says in verse 16, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the feeding trough after they saw the baby. Verse 17 says this. They spread the story of what they had experienced. They spread the story. They told folk. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you spread the story? When was the last time you told somebody about your spiritual experience of meeting Jesus for the first time like they did? Why don't we? Or why do we? And then that kind of wanes as time goes on. And we don't share it. Now why? It makes me wonder, did you really experience it? Because when you experience something in your life, it becomes part of you. You never forget it. You can go back and remember God encounters that you never forgot. Because you experienced it. See, we've turned, we've turned the gospel message of the kingdom into an intellectual story, or this is just a story we think, and we don't experience it. When was the last time you just reflected back when you met Jesus for the first time what they did? Don't get quiet on me, think. Because it ought to be an excitement. The message hasn't changed. The angel said, look it, I've got great joy for everybody. Did he continue to go around and tell folk? No. So that group of guys, as we read the rest of the story, Mary and Joseph didn't even know. They knew, but the shepherds came and told them. It said they had experienced and what had been said to them about the child. They spread the story, not about their experience. Hey, you won't believe it. This big dude showed up and it was all lit up. No, no, no. They actually shared what he actually said to them too. 
Hey, we got great news! The Liberator has come! The Anointed One has come! The Lord Himself has been birthed upon the earth. Didn't just share this was a great thing, like we do. No, 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 the message also. And look at verse 18, this is very interesting. Because you know what, we're so, we get to that place of being so afraid to share the story. It says in verse 18, everyone who heard this story couldn't stop thinking about its meaning. Verse 19, Mary too pondered all these events, treasuring each memory in her heart. Everybody that heard the story couldn't stop thinking about its meaning. Why? Maybe because the one sharing it was pretty excited about it? Yeah. And it wasn't just a passing on of information, but it was actually a passing on of a personal experience with the emotions of that? See, that's what's happened today in the church. We've made everything intellectual. We pass on information without the personal experience that goes with that information. And we've got to get back to the place where we are buzzing, where we are fired up, where we are stirred up, and understand, you know what? This is awesome. This is great news for all people, every tribe, every nation. God wants them to glorify Him. Amen. Every nation, tongue, tribe. It's a worldwide message. And then in verse 20 it says, The shepherds returned to their flocks, praising God for all they had seen and heard. And they glorified God for the way the experience had unfolded just as the heavenly messengers had predicted. So it didn't stop with the event. So a lot of times we tell a story, and then all of a sudden the story peters out because we're just sharing information, right? I mean, even today, we drove by and we saw flags at half-mast and asked Robin, why are they still at half-mast? What's going on? She said, oh, it's for President Bush. It was supposed to be for a whole month. See, that story's already history. That's how we respond to things. You know, how many of you know they busted a human trafficking ring here in New Hampshire? Yeah. Right. They did. Was it in Concord or Manchester? Concord. But it's already like... Past history. It was. Which is recent. Yeah. And see, that's what we do with our religious experiences, too. We don't stay abuzz. We don't stay excited. Because many times I think they're here and not here. But the shepherds put it here. They stayed buzzing. They stayed excited. They kept glorifying God. Even when they went back. And they continue to share the message because that's how the message gets propagated. Amen? Amen. Angels ain't showing up today. We got to continue to spread the word. Amen? Amen. We got to continue. You know, we like to put the little cliches on Facebook Jesus is the reason for the season. Who even knows what that means? Uh, it's got to be, you know what? We're going to tell the story in a way. That excites us once again. We've got to get excited about being who we are, a son of God. Mm -hmm. It has to excite us. And we run into someone that's not a son of God yet, it ought to excite us because we got a great story to tell them. Amen. Don't make the story about us, make it about him. Right. That's what they did. A liberator showed up. Mm -hmm. We don't have to be in bondage to fear. Anymore. You don't have to have those nightmares. Anymore. You don't have to struggle with addictions. Anymore. You don't have to struggle with finances. Anymore. There's a liberator that has showed up. <coughs> but many of us won't tell that story. But share those things I just shared because you've not personally experienced them. You're still in bondage. 
we're trying all different means to get out of that. When all we need to do is receive the liberator. Amen? Amen. Get person excited that he's on the inside. So I want to ask you this morning, have you personally experienced Christmas story to the place that you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You might be thinking, yeah. And you might be thinking, I'm not sure. This is how you can make sure if you know Jesus as your Lord. One, you've prayed and confessed Him as your Lord. You've asked Him to come in. But if you were to die tonight, do you know you'd go to heaven? I mean, for sure. No doubt. Nobody can't talk you out of it. Nobody can do anything to mess it up. Because if you're not sure, then you haven't. And if you think you have, you're still not sure. Because the Bible says that His Spirit was given to us to bear witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. Now how you know He literally comes in and lives within you. And you know that you know that you know. You know why? You had a God experience. He showed up. And when He came in inside, boy, you knew He showed up on the inside. If you can't go back to a time and a place where that occurred, you may want to make sure of that before you leave today. We'll do that with you. Because what better day to receive the newborn king, then on his birthday, amen? amen? Amen. To make sure that you know that you know. I don't care how old you are. You nope. know what I mean? I don't care how long you think you thought you were. <laughs> Did that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. I didn't know why you were chuckling. <laughs> I, I mean, I've seen grown people come down the aisle and say, you know what, for 30 years I thought I knew Jesus, but I really didn't. Seeing, seeing kids. I mean, I remember my daughter, 11 years old. I prayed with her when she was five. We baptized her in the bathtub. We had the mobile home at the time because the church didn't have a baptistry. But at 11 years old, she walked down again and said, Dad, I want to make sure. Let's do it. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen? Amen. Because you got to be sure because you only get one shot at this thing. Because when your time's up, your time's up. You're going up or you're going down. The decision is made now. Right. Last question I got is this. Have you personally experienced this amazing event to the place where the excitement drives you to where you got to share the story with everybody? Mm -hmm. It drives you. Not, not, because some people just do it out of obedience. Oh, the Bible says we're commanded. Go make disciples, baptize them, blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to do it out of obedience. No, 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 no. You do things and you hate doing simply out of obedience. That's right. Mm -hmm. God don't look at it that way. It looks on the heart. Because usually when we do that, we do it out of fear. We do it out of condemnation. We do it, do it because we think it gains us brownie points, so to speak, with God. No, no, no. That's still all disobedience. We share the story out of an excitement that's in our heart because God's living in there and He's like, I love them and I want that one. So when we run into somebody that don't know the story, man, we ought to get excited to tell the story. Amen. And if you can't get excited, you've got to look on the inside and say, where did my excitement go? Maybe like that church in Revelation 2 where it says, hey, you lost your first love. Where'd that excitement go? That excitement that you just couldn't wait to share a God experience with someone. And I'm not just talking about this. This is what we're talking about this morning. But I mean even a God encounter. Even a revelation out of Scripture. I mean, I got a revelation for somebody yesterday who sent him a text. When have you ever done that? Got excited about something you had to tell them right away. Know what I mean? That excitement needs to come back, guys. That excitement where you know what? Hey, I'm born again. If you really are. The Spirit of God is in me. Man, He's empowered me to do all things through Christ that strengthens me. He's got to stop being little 
religious cliches in our lives that we like to spit out to show how spiritual we are. No, no, no. When you really look on the inside and you take inventory, is excitement there? Is enthusiasm there? If not, where to go? When you run into somebody that's not born again, are you excited to tell them about Jesus and how they can be liberated and set free? Don't you remember what he did for you? Man, he set me free from drugs and alcohol and adultery and all kinds of stupid stuff. Sexual sins, all kinds of stuff. I've been set free. So when we look at somebody bound up in that stuff, you don't say, oh, poor them. No, you got the liberator on the inside, amen? Amen. amen. Share with them. Now, if they don't want to receive that, that's on them. Yeah. But God forbid, I don't want to get there and hear from say, Jim, why didn't you share that with that person? I set that divine appointment up and you were too busy doing your Christmas shopping and you walked right by them like nothing, even though my spirit was telling you, stop and talk to them. Yep. I don't want that to happen no more. And this spoke to my heart about the excitement once again. That excitement's got to come back. Amen? Amen? That enthusiasm. That feeling when you first got saved. Really, Lord? Okay. You know what we got to do some of? And I'll be honest with you, I've been doing this for two days. I was doing it just this morning downstairs. When the candy cane story was being told, I said, I got to go downstairs. And I was doing repenting down there. We got to come to a place of repentance in our life again. Yes. You know, sin is no joke. No. You got to be clean. You got to be clean. Rebellion is as witchcraft. And there's a lot of witchcraft going on in the house of God because there's rebellion. Because we've allowed this greasy grace to come in and think it's okay to do some of the things we think are okay and they're not okay with Him. We've got to get back to the place where you know what? I'm here on this earth to fulfill and walk out a destiny and a calling. And that's it. Nothing else matters. You don't run over people to do that. That's not what I'm saying. But you've got to know that you know I'm here for a purpose. And anything that tries to come and sidetracks me is not of God. It's of the enemy. And because of that, I need to walk it out. But I need to walk it out in enthusiasm and excitement, understanding we have a gospel of the kingdom. There's one way in. I heard it this morning. Jesus is the door. And he's knocking on your heart right now. And if you open the door, he'll come in and sup with you. He wants to sit down and get to know you. And then once he sits down and gets to know you, don't start taking that relationship for granted. Amen. It's special relationship. It's really special. Because the God of all creation decided to pick you out and come in you and hang out. And if he's not in there hanging out, before you go, let's talk about it. Amen. 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 And if he is in there hanging out, you've sent him to another room, maybe we're going to talk about that too. You've got to get that right. How about we just get that point right, right now? How's that? And we'll wrap it up. Amen? Amen. So let's Amen. pray. Father, Lord, we worship you and praise you and honor you, and I don't want that to be a religious cliche anymore. And I know those here don't want that either. But Father, the honest truth is we've walked away from that first love. The fire is not as hot as it was when we first met you. The excitement is not at the same level as it was when we first met you. And Lord, the reason is, is because we've allowed stuff to creep into our life that ought not to be there. 
So, Father, we need to repent. We need to change our mind concerning those things we've accepted into our life or people around us or whatever that influence us. Because, Lord, you said we're not, we're not to avoid people. That's not the thing. What we ought to avoid is their influence upon our life if they influence us away from you and your love and our calling and our purpose and our destiny. We can still love them, but we're just going to give them no more influence. So, Father, we repent of that this morning. Father, may there be a buzz created once again at Destiny Christian Church. A buzz where there is spiritual conversation going on. Excitement about what you're doing in our lives. Instead of the conversations that do go on. And Lord, from that, may it just become a personal experience where we cannot not share. As Paul said, I'm compelled I can't keep my mouth shut. Lord, we've been silent too long. And we need to repent of that. Because, Lord, there's people that we care about and we bought that stupid lie that we don't want to offend them, that we push them further away. How far are they already gone? They're already hanging over the cliff, headed for hell. And the thing is, they don't know there's an option. They don't understand that you have your hand out asking them to come unto you. You're knocking on the door of their heart. And we don't even understand that or discern that because we're so afraid of them is really what it is. We're not afraid of offending them. We're afraid of the response we're going to get back from them. So, Father, we need to repent of this. Because mm -hmm. it's not about us. It's about you and your kingdom. Because, Lord, your word says we're dead. Amen. We're dead men walking. But, Lord, we're not dead. We're alive in Christ. With the power of the Spirit. To manifest your glory in this realm. But we bought too many lives. And Father, if there's anyone here this morning that is not sure they're going to heaven, if they were to die tonight, don't let them walk out that door. Lord, I bind every demon right now that wants to drive out the door. They can't leave until they get that right. Because Father, that ain't about us, about you. You sent the liberator the Messiah, and the Lord to set them free. Amen. That's what this holiday is about we celebrate. Freedom, good news, a great joy, peace. Lord, that once again we would feel that peace when nothing matters. Where we don't get worked up over nothing. Because we have the peace and the joy by the Holy Ghost in our hearts. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what it represents. We thank you for what Tuesday represents. Lord, we're going to see a lot of people over these next few days. Lord, put the excitement in our heart that we may have a conversation with someone, even this day, and share the good news with them. And we thank you for it all now. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Merry Christmas and don't run away because we got cake and goodies and stuff to boot.